Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying thirty, sixty, or even a hundred times. Then Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, six, thirty, sixty, or even a hundred times what was sown. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Elizabeth. We appreciate your reading for us this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. Glad you've taken the time to connect with us again. If you've been tracking with us over the last several weeks, then you know that we've been in the midst of grappling with the parable of the sower. We began with reading Matthew's account of the parable, and last week we read from Luke's gospel. And this week, we're going to look at the parable from Mark's perspective. If you'd like to follow along in your Bibles at home, you'll find Mark's version uh, at the start of chapter 4 of his gospel. Unlike Matthew and Luke, Mark begins by describing the, the size of the crowd. He tells us it was so large that it forced Jesus to actually get into one of the boats nearby and, and sort of push off from the shore. You may or may not be aware of this, but Mark... Uh, like Luke, was likely not an eyewitness of these accounts. Tradition tells us that Mark was likely the John Mark of Acts who abandoned Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. Later in his life, he matured some and became helpful to Paul and particularly helpful to Peter in the writing of this gospel. Peter, being a fisherman and a man that lived his life on that lake, uh, was likely on the boat with Jesus that day. And I think it's helpful for us to realize that by sitting in a boat a few yards from the shore, Jesus had, was actually taking advantage of the natural amphitheater created by the water. In this way, Jesus' voice could carry and be heard by this large crowd that Mark describes. Now, we're not told this in Scripture, so it's total conjecture, but some have suggested that uh, maybe within view of the crowd, there may have been a farmer sowing his seed up on the, uh, the hill. Certainly possible. And that Jesus took advantage of this farmer's sowing as, as an opportunity for a live analogy for his parable. Interesting for sure, but not necessary. As a farmer sowing his seed in the field was a, was a scene immediately familiar to everyone on the shore that day. Mark tells us that in verse 2 that Jesus taught the crowds many things that day. But in particular, and unique to Mark, is the way that Jesus addressed the crowds right from the start. In verse 3, Jesus begins by saying, listen, 
behold. It would be equivalent to our hear ye, hear ye. Another way we could look at it is that Jesus is saying to the crowds, listen, or take heed, behold, or see. Both these Greek words used here are, are, are often carry a metaphorical meaning, to see with the mind, to hear with the heart, or perceive with inward spiritual perception. All this is in the range here. Clearly from the very beginning, by the use of these words, I think Jesus is indicating right up front that what he's about to say will require not only uh, full attention, but spiritual perception as well. Right away, Jesus is drawing in the connection to Isaiah 6 uh, that he will later quote. Though re recorded at varying lengths, Isaiah, like the parable of the sower itself, is recorded in all three gospel accounts. And whenever we see a phrase or find an event recorded by all three of the synoptic gospel writers, it's, it's evidence of its importance. And we should be aware that God is intent on teaching us something um, of significance. We, we should also infer Jesus is telling us, as well as the crowds of that day, that how we listen to this parable matters. We've been saying that, right? It matters greatly how we listen. Mark also mentions another interesting tidbit concerning who was there to hear the parable's explanation. Mark tells us that the 12 were present, but he goes out of his way in verse 10 to mention that there were others there as well. If we go to Luke's account in chapter 8, we discover this uh, that at the time, Jesus was traveling about from village to village, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Luke also mentions that 12 were with him, but Luke goes out of his way to mention that there were some women there also. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, who was the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. And Luke informs us these women were helping support Jesus and his ministry out of their own means. And though not referred to as disciples, uh, these women were clearly dedicated followers of Jesus. And while the culture in Judaism did not recognize them as such, Jesus certainly did. It was very likely that Mark is telling us that these are the ones who, in addition to the twelve, were around Jesus and included in the explanation of the parable. If that be so, and I believe it is, these women were included in the inner circle with the twelve apostles. And they, like us, were privileged to hear and understand what Jesus called the secrets of the kingdom of God. Matthew draws this out a bit more in his gospel, recording Jesus as saying, Blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. We all should realize the privilege that we've been given through the Holy Spirit, that our hearts and our minds have been opened to what we have received, uh, this revelation that many of the Old Testament prophets, saints, and even the angels long to look into, long to see and hear. We also have been blessed, as Jesus declared, with eyes that see and ears that can hear. And then there's one last observation before we move on also exclusive to Mark's gospel, are the two questions of verse 13. Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? And I know at first we might be inclined to think, of, that's a bit harsh, <laughs> Jesus would put it this way. But the twelve and those who traveled with him not only heard his preaching on a daily basis, they had access to private conversations with Jesus. They likely were in earshot of other conversations that he had. Further, the culture of the of rabbinical teaching of the first century utilized parables as a typical means of teaching. So this was a means they were very, very familiar with. It's not a stretch to say that Jesus had reasonable expectation that, that his disciples would have some clue as to what the parable meant. I think what we see here is how amazed Jesus was at the dullness of his disciples. We see the same dullness a few chapters later after the feeding of the 4,000. 
As they were crossing the lake, Jesus warns them to be on guard against the, the leaven of the Pharisees. And of course, he means their teachings. And the disciples, they look at one another and ask, is it because we only took one loaf of bread that he's saying this to us? And Jesus is like, are you guys kidding me? Clearly, none of the women were on board to help with the higher math here. What are you talking about? Have, why are you talking about having no bread? And it's interesting that he uses the language of Isaiah here to correct them. Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? Don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets of, of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets of pieces did you pick up? Seven, they answered. Do you still not understand, he said to them? I see Jesus like scratching his head and asking, can, these, can this guy really be this dull? This is the crew I'm going to change the world with? And I'm sure that, that we're all not all that better sometimes, right? Jesus probably is scratching his head over us pretty often as well. But what makes the question of verse 13 important for us is the commitment that Jesus makes concerning understanding the parable as key to understanding all other parables. We've talked about this some. Indeed, key to understanding much in what Jesus teaches elsewhere in the Gospels. That being the case, it makes it worth every effort to grasp what Jesus is trying to teach us here. The parable of the sower though easily one of the most famous of Jesus' parables, is also one of the most difficult. Not so much, I think, in its interpretation, though there are some struggles there, but more in its application within the church and in our daily lives. Most people see the parable as centered on the message of salvation. We've talked about that. The sower is Christ, the seed is the word of God, and then the parable goes on to identify the kinds of hearts that hear the word and yet they respond differently. Only one, though, produces fruit, while the other three produce nothing. Most would agree that's an accurate way to understand the parable. As Christians, we're well aware that salvation has everything to do with living a life centered on God. Clearly, hearing and receiving of the Word of God obviously includes coming to a knowledge of the work of Christ on the cross and accepting repentance and direction in our lives. So salvation is perfectly legitimate understanding of the parable and likely the way the early church understood it and actually taught it. And yet if we approach this parable with this only one-dimensional interpretation, we're going to miss the broader application for sanctification and the benefit in the lives of us believers. Believers who, who like us struggle with the negative characteristics and reactions that are described in this parable. And though I believe salvation is a primary application, it's clearly not the only way we can or even should understand what Jesus taught that day at the lake. And most of us, I think, or as most of us have discovered, our, our, our initial salvation experience was just a beginning. And in truth, only the point in which the work of sanctification began. So much more to, to come. And I think most of us wish God would have accomplished our complete transformation right then and there. Wouldn't that have been so much easier? Most of us are often grieved after years of living out the Christian faith that we are still prone to angry outbursts and petty thinking and behavior. We, it can be pre, pretty ugly at times. Most of us wish that, that all that could have been sort of wiped away when we said, I do to Jesus. But it's not the way that God works. There's something very real, something very tangible and about this difficulty in going through the process of sanctification. And it requires struggle. And for some reason, God wants that for us. There's something he's doing in that. Not only does it require our continued engagement with God's word, but it also requires a sustained effort to remain open to God's convictions and the changes that he wants to bring into our hearts and into our lives. Clearly, this is the case not only for us, but for our first century counterparts as well. If that were not so, there would have been no reason for much of the instruction written throughout the New Testament letters and epistles. Though we're saved, 
and have the Holy Spirit in our hearts, the truth is we still engage in and even justify sinful behavior that if not checked will eventually drive a wedge between us and God. Now if you recall from last week, we defined the term sanctification as a work of grace set in motion at salvation that sets a believer apart as holy unto God, separated from the things of this world, and dedicated for God's use. It is the process by which we learn to live in the world, but not be of the world. And this is why the language of never receiving, of falling away, or being choked out, needs to be taken so seriously. Because one cannot enter the process of sanctification without being saved nor can one make any progress in the work of sanctification if they have fallen away from Christ, or if they're living in such a way as to be unproductive in the work of sanctification itself. And from the Westminster Catechism, if I can get that right this week. I had some trouble last week getting that and a few other words out. Christopher was kidding me. He says, Dad, don't, don't they give you like cue cards or something? <laughs> anyway, the definition from the Westminster and, and this is a slight paraphrase. Sanctification does not mean that sin is instantly eradicated, yet it's more than a counter-reaction. In sanctification, sin is not merely restrained or repressed, but it is progressively destroyed. Sanctification is a real transformation, not just the appearance of one. I like that. I think that's helpful in many ways. Clearly, the biblical writers of the New Testament, especially Paul, were adamant that spiritual growth wasn't an option. John Wesley, founder of the Methodist movement, commented the following. Just like salvation, sanctification is prompted by the word of God scattered out to our hearts. In the same way I might have lived unaware of my need for God until God spoke to me, I might live unaware of a way in which I stayed separate from God until God showed me how it drove a wedge between us. We need to recognize that Jesus is teaching, not only in this parable, but across the board, are meant to provoke a response in the heart of believers and unbelievers alike. Some for the purpose of salvation, absolutely while for others who have accepted the Lord's offer of grace, his teachings then play a role in our ongoing sanctification. Now that may be, I don't know, oversimplifying things, but I think it'll be helpful to keep that distinction in mind as we move forward today. If you're not a committed believer in Jesus Christ, then for you, the parable is about your salvation. And the initial heart response of repentance is necessary for you to receive God's saving grace in Christ. And I hope that you will do that. At the end of this message, my, my email is, 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 is on the display. Please contact me and let me know if there's any way I can help you come to, come to that decision. But for the believer, however, today's message is not intended to cause a questioning of your salvation. Rather, it's meant to encourage your walk of sanctification in Christ. Either way, the parable and the sayings of Jesus are often difficult to accept and live out. It doesn't matter which side of this you're on, they're difficult to accept and live out. Christianity is not meant for the faint of heart. The commitment to Christ, the changes that are required in lifestyle and practice, these are often very, very difficult for believers to successfully live out. That's true, isn't it? Again, Christianity is not meant for the faint of heart. I think that's what Jesus had in mind, actually, when he suggested that we should count the cost. That's what he meant. Count the cost. There's a cost to this. Jesus never implied that following him would be a walk in the park. Now, there were two distinct audiences in the crowd that day by the lake. There were those, as Luke informs us, of the fourth soil, with a good and noble heart, with the exception of Judas, his closest disciples actually fell into this category. They didn't always grasp the depth of his teaching, yet they were committed to following Jesus. They made mistakes, but they were committed to following Jesus. And they tried to live out whatever he taught. Um, this Jesus describes as those of the good soil. This is what the good heart looks like. 
And then there were those of the rest of the crowd in whom we have no real knowledge of what happened in their heart that day. I'm sure some were of the good soil and they eventually followed Jesus. On the other hand, experience tells us we can be just as sure that others in the crowd, they likely fell away on account of persecution or were eventually choked out by the deceptions of riches and the general clamor of the world. Anyway, with this multi-dimensional track in mind, I've tried to approach the parable with the realization that there are actually three tiers or three, three streams running simultaneously through the story. We've seen this before, so just a reminder. The first was salvation, and certainly the, the parable has much to say about that. The second uh, that we're discussing now this morning is sanctification. And, and the last, which we have yet to explore, is the redemptive historical application of Jesus' teaching. Even in salvation, our hearts are very much like the soils that Jesus tells about in this parable. That's what makes this parable so uncomfortable for us. Even in sanctification, even though we're sanctified and saved, our hearts are very much like the soils that Jesus talks about. It's like seeing a picture of ourselves on a, a bad hair day or being caught on film in the midst of one of our worst moments. Sometimes our hearts are packed down by hard by anger or painful events of our lives. And we find ourselves closed off to the voice of God. We try and read a passage, but it's like banging our head against a wall to get it in. We read it over and over, but we find it's very much like Matthew tells us, the enemy is like snatching it away before we can even hear what the Spirit is trying to say to our hearts. Or we might find ourselves closed off to a word uh, because of pride or arrogance or intellectualism. We might read something in God's Word that goes against our personal experience, our personal code, or doesn't quite fit into our worldview, and so we struggle to trust the Lord in it. We want to give God some advice sometimes, don't we? we? We like it if he would at least consider our opinion about some of these things. We've all been there. All you can do at times like that is trust God and put it away until the clouds of stormy emotions lift some. I have found over the years that God is very good at bringing healing to our wounds and change to our hearts if we will allow it and if we will stay with it. And that's, that's where the second soil comes in. It's why we need to grow deep in the Lord. Life has a way of handing some big lumps, tragedies and disappointments to us. We know that these things happen to other people. But for some reason, we expect that because of our faith, God will somehow spare us. And yet it's often because of our faith that God allows these things. Because he knows that we will handle them with dignity and grace. And he knows that he can build us through them. He knows that if we trust him through the process, others will come to, to a knowledge of Jesus Christ through our witness and our example. He knows we can handle it. And no one wishes these things upon themselves or others, but we live in a very broken world, don't we? Where broken things happen. Certainly these past months, and especially this last week in our country, I think the brokenness of our world is, is pretty evident to everybody. There are some ways, even, even those who grow up in the faith, and yet never, they never grow deep enough in their own convictions, and then they struggle with the trials of life. If our relationship to God is only a surface attachment or only about habits and lifestyle, then our faith likely won't survive life's ordeals. Look at the language of Mark 4, verse 5 here. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. It's a faith that springs up quickly, Jesus describes. And while it springs up quickly, Jesus suggests that it also falls away just as quickly as it sprung up. It's a short-lived faith, Jesus suggests. It's, it's a faith that lacks any substance. It doesn't have much soil. It doesn't have much heart to grow in. It's a faith that springs up quickly with great joy, uh, and yet it's a faith that is easily scorched. We have another word for that today, burnt out. 
We call it burnt out. I've seen it many times over the years. People come to the church and they make a profession of faith and then they get involved in everything because they have no boundaries. Or as Mark writes, they have no root in themselves. And then the day comes when the newness wears off. And then the, the work needs to begin on their heart and their lives and, and they're growing in maturity. Or someone in the church doesn't appreciate their service in a way they thought it ought to be appreciated. And then you can almost see them as they wither away. And to be fair, there are people in the church that do like to complain about things and struggle to appreciate the time and effort that others put in. And they need to grow in that area too. We've all encountered people like that. They have the gift of criticism and they, they have a knack for sharing that gift with others, whether it's invited or not. Now, it may sound silly, but these are the things that can uproot those with little depth. Like tender shoots, they, they can't survive being stepped on even once. I mentioned this saying before, and it, I think it bears repeating in this context. I don't know who said it, but I think it's spot on. Christians need to be thick-skinned and warm-hearted rather than thin-skinned and cold-hearted. Too often we see minor and even trivial things separate Christian brothers and sisters. And all too often when the smoke clears, somebody is gone. Somebody has walked away offended. This is where growth in the word, deepening of our loyalty and heart for Christ, deepening in our love for one another, makes all the difference in the world. If we're going to walk through the pains and tragedies of life and work through difficulties between brothers and sisters in the church, deepen, deepening our roots is absolutely essential. Now, I doubt Jesus had all that in mind when he shared this parable. Maybe he did. He spoke of trouble, and persecution on account of the word. That's what he was focusing on. And in, his first, and in first century Judaism, that was a reality. The disciples were hiding in a room after Jesus was crucified for a very good reason. Stephen was stoned to death soon afterwards, and a great persecution came upon the church in Acts. And as we know, Saul, who was later known as the Apostle Paul, was the one leading the charge to beat and drag off the Jesus followers to prison or worse. So persecution was a real deal back when Jesus spoke about it. It was a real deal in the early centuries as Rome ordered Christians beheaded, burned at the stake, or thrown to the lions as sport for the crowds of the Colosseum. It's a real day, deal today in many places around the world where Christians are being martyred for their faith. And yet for those of the fourth soil type, with good and noble hearts, the, their roots in Christ, um, and often... Uh, and often in the church and the kingdom actually grows in the midst of that kind of persecution. They are the ones who produce the 30, the 60, and 100 fold. Growing deeper in Christ is worth any effort we need to make. For God will never be able to take us deeper or speak to us about deeper things, share his heart in a deeper way, if we've yet to develop the depth and reflection to be able to handle it. This is what Jesus meant when he said, he who has ears, let him hear. See, God is in the business of producing men and women who can walk through the fire in this life and yet come out the other side with their faith intact. Children whose roots are deep within him. Children who are not withered by the drama and the difficulty of life. Children who are, are focused and able to stand in the, in the face of life's difficulties and be more than conquerors, as Paul speaks of in Romans. God is, the, is in the business of producing men and women who will be like trees planted in the river of God's Spirit, whose roots draw moisture from that stream and whose leaf remain green no matter what the season. Those are some good words. Those are some good reasons to grow deep, aren't they? Well, that's kind of all we we'll have time for today. Hopefully you can make it next week as we finish up with sanctification. Next week we'll look at the seed cast among the thorns, the anxieties of life, and the deception of riches. Clearly a soil type that most of us struggle with. But God is faithful, and he will provide not only wisdom, but faith for us to overcome. I look forward to being with you all again next week. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your wonderful words, this parable, 
the story that, that speaks to our hearts in a way that, that nothing else can. Lord, we pray the imagery, um, the, your words, your illustrations would touch us in a unique and a special way today. Lord, I pray for those who are in your spirit, that are in you, that are questioning their own salvation, Lord. And I pray as we come to the communion table in a few minutes, Lord, that, that, that we would all have an opportunity to just re-engage with the covenant, the new and everlasting covenant that you have given us by your blood and by your, the sacrifice of your life. And that that would give us the confidence to know that we are in you, Lord, but at the same time, I ask for the Holy Spirit's conviction for ways in which we need to grow up and ways we need to uh, mature and ways we need to uh, be more about the things of the kingdom and less about the things of the world. We pray, Lord, that our minds and our hearts would be open to that correction of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that uh, we would be excited about what you're doing in our life and what you're doing in our church and how you're drawing us forward to be the people that you want us to be. For nothing, nothing on earth could be of, of greater value than a soul and a heart sold out for Jesus Christ. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for the, for the privilege and the opportunity to be called the children of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.